kind of a, um, a bit of a, a bit of a zombie, but um, in any case, I'm so uh, happy to join all of you today. Um, as Dr. Beard shared, my name is Sarah Henry, and I do serve as the uh, the founder uh, and editor in chief at Heartful Editor. Uh, Heartful Editor has been an organization for five years. Um, Johnson University was actually one of our earliest campus partners, um, and I wanted to uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of APA style, I wanted to share just a brief uh, a brief brief little bit of background about how I sort of came uh, to do this work. Um, so you'll see here uh, my, uh, my very first uh, quote unquote computer. Um, I was in eighth grade circa 1992 um, when I first learned APA style and I was in eighth grade, uh, if you can believe it. Uh, and I had an eighth grade English teacher, Mr. Frank Antonoli, who really wanted us to be responsible consumers of knowledge. And so even then at 12 years old, using the Dewey Decimal System and going to the library with my pocket full of dimes to make copies of sources, um, it was still important at that time that as, as we learned about academic writing, that we learned how to really give credit where credit was due and cite our sources appropriately. Um, I first learned uh, academic writing and, and uh, all things APA citations on this IBM Lexmark 1000 typewriter. So I'm really, uh, really dating myself here. Some of you might, uh, might recall having something uh, similar. Um, but this is sort of where the journey with APA began for, uh, for me. And um, usually when I present these sessions, I probably present 50 to 75 uh, webinars and workshops uh, a year. Um, usually when I ask students, you know, what is the one word that comes to mind when you think of APA style? Um, the response is generally pretty negative. <laughs> so you probably wouldn't be surprised to know that the types of words that I get in response are things like tedious or uh, confusing or overwhelming. Um, I often get uh, just a UGH, which you know is the the ugh uh, associated with with this style manual. Um, and I'm probably one of the rare people in the world who actually completely love it and do it all day long every day uh, for a job uh, on purpose. <laughs> Um, but I do, um, I do love this work, and I have been working with APA. Um, you know, yes, uh, I started when I was twelve, but I also used APA in my uh, in high school, in my undergraduate degree, in my master's degree, um, and then in my doctoral degree, um, all the way uh, through the sixth edition. Um, and then of course the transition to the seventh edition happened uh, in October of 2019. Um, so I sort of went back to being a little bit of a newbie because I had to re, you know, relearn uh, a lot of uh, the, the guidelines that of course shifted with the, the release of the new, uh, the new edition. Um, but our, uh, our organization is a, a mission-driven and values-based organization. Um, one of the things that I really thought about deeply when I started doing this work professionally was that I didn't want to uh, lead a, a transactional company. I didn't want something that was solely technical. And the more I thought about my values as an educator. Uh, I, I uh, spent 15 years in higher education supporting college students and I wanted to continue to provide service to the community um, through this sort of technical skill set, but I didn't want the company to be focused solely on the technical. Um, and so this was really an opportunity um, to think about writing in a different way uh, for me and how I wanted to really make this my life's work. Um, so our mission as an organization is to help students and faculty find their voice strengthen their writing and make a positive difference in the community through their scholarship. Um, and our values uh, are things that you might not expect to see at, a, uh, <laughs> at an academic editing and coaching company, um, but love is at the center of what we do. Uh, first and foremost is love for our students, um, but also love for the academic writing process. And I'll talk a little bit more about kind of why, <laughs> why we love the academic writing process so much. Um, we also really value integrity, academic excellence, diversity and inclusion, progress over perfection, challenge and support, transformation, self-care and access. Um, you can find us on Twitter, on Facebook. Uh, we also have our community of scholars listserv, so you can find us there. And I will also make sure that you get a copy of these slides um, after I am finished presenting today. So you will have these to serve as a supplement to, um, to the manual. Um, so as I mentioned, one of the things that I um, 
really uh, wanted to sort of focus on as I uh, developed Heartful Editor was to really think about the transformative power of writing uh, within our communities. And so our philosophy as an organization is that writing is one of the most powerful forms of communication that we can use to affect positive change in our communities. And so one of the things that I like to um, ask students uh, it, to think about is what is your why or your purpose for writing? What problem do you want to solve? What community do you hope to serve through your scholarship? And then how will you use writing to make your community better and in what way? So when we think about having an impact in the community in a positive way, we think about writing as a way to um, uh, to affect positive change. So we can really connect our purpose uh, for uh, serving the community with our writing practice uh, for the purposes of affecting positive change. Um, so I leave you with this question, uh, how will you change the world as a writer? Um, and part of the reason I talk about this is because I think often when we think of APA style, we sort of, uh, we, we do tend to attach some, some more negative terms uh, to it. Um, it's generally not something that elicits the most positive reactions. Um, but APA was developed in 1929 by psychologists who really wanted um, really wanted to streamline the, their academic writing, uh, their research results, how results were presented, and so on, um, so that their audience could really focus on the heart of the manuscript. And that really ultimately is their message and the difference that they want to make in the community through their scholarship. Um, so while we tend to think of APA as being this sort of annoying thing that we have to attend to at some point, um, it really does help readers to focus more intently on our content, on our message, um, and the ways that we want to make a difference. Um, and so I think sometimes it can help us to reframe APA a little bit when we really connect to what our why is, right? What our purpose is for affecting change in the community through our scholarship and look at APA as a way to sort of facilitate that change by removing distractions from a manuscript that really are just taking the reader's attention away from what is most important to you. Um, so when we um, do these sessions, we, uh, like I mentioned, I probably uh, do 50 to 75 webinars a year, um, and we probably train upwards of 3,000 people a year on, uh, on APA style. So it's a pretty regular part of our practice. Um, and we get a lot of questions about what are some of the general academic writing challenges that, um, that we see in the work that we do. And we have a, a team of about 50 academic coaches and editors. So as we're working with students, we're often talking about, you know, what are the types of things that we're seeing from student to student? Um, and one of the reasons I like to share this is that I think that it can feel kind of lonely as a doctoral student sometimes. We, we might experience challenges. Um, and I know at least for myself, when I was in my doctoral program, I sort of felt like those challenges were sort of unique to me. Like I somehow was the only person struggling uh, to kind of make sense of academic writing and get and wrap my head around, okay, well, I've, I've sort of always been an A student, but now I'm getting feedback that I'm, you know, really not hitting the mark with my literature review or whatever, and like what's missing. Um, and so that was really uh, challenging for me, and it is for a lot of students. And so I like to kind of share, you know, what are some of the things that we tend to see from student to student, just to kind of um, help students to understand how pervasive some of these challenges actually are. Um, so first, uh, the, the probably the first thing that we see uh, very, very often is um, students really struggling to, to determine what their topic is for their dissertation, um, what is the sort of that burning question that they want to ask, um, and then what's the significance of the topic? So why, why do we care about this particular topic? Um, uh, so once you get to the point where you sort of know your topic uh, and you think you know your significance, uh, the significance of your topic, uh, a good exercise is to sort of practice the elevator pitch, right? Can you talk, can you succinctly describe your topic and also why it matters? Uh, if you were uh, on an elevator with someone for maybe less than a minute, for example. So really trying to narrow, narrow that down as much as possible. Um, we see a lot of students diving in without adequate preparation. This could be not knowing who their audience is, but it could also be not using APA's heading levels in a way that really helps you to structure and organize your writing. 
Uh, we see a lot of students challenged with structuring the literature review and really making a coherent argument rather than sort of presenting a, a book report style chapter. Um, and uh, so it's really important uh, to when, when we review literature to present that either thematically or chronologically or whatever would make sense for the presentation of, um, of the literature. Uh, but that's something that we see uh, probably of all of the chapters, probably chapter two is the one where we hear the most um, sort of confusion, distress, anxiety, uh, and so on. Um, we also see a lot of students um, struggle with kind of closing the circle between their conceptual or theoretical framework and the literature that they reviewed in their literature review um, and the results that they have found in their study. Um, and we forget sometimes that the dissertation is a full document. All of the parts should connect. There should be a, a through line that goes all the way through the dissertation. There should be a story there that is compelling, um, both in terms of providing an overview of uh, sort of the current landscape of your topic, but also why this matters and what the implications are at the end. And all of that should really tie together. Um, I, I uh, am an adjunct faculty member at a couple of campuses, and one of the classes that I teach every year is called Finish Strong. Uh, and I specifically work with students uh, who have completed their data collection and have um, pretty much finished their analysis. Uh, and we work specifically on chapters four and five and making sure that all of the dots are connected between the first three chapters and the final two chapters of the dissertation. Uh, we see a lot of students uh, struggling with the shift from being a practitioner to a researcher, right? So we oftentimes spend a good amount of time in our professional lives amassing a significant amount of professional knowledge that we sort of come to know as, as truth or fact. Uh, and then all of a sudden, we, uh, we start a doctoral program and, and people keep telling us that we need to cite everything and it <laughs> can be very confusing. Um, so remembering, of course, that in academic writing, uh, anytime we make a claim or an assertion, we need to substantiate that with evidence from the literature. Um, time management and accountability are, of course, challenges for, uh, for all of us. Um, and lastly, I would say perfectionism and expectations are things that we, uh, we see students contend with all the time. And sometimes that might be our, our own self-imposed perfectionism that might be coming from uh, committee members or the campus or whomever. Um, but these are things that, that certainly can get in the way of our writing process. Um, related to APA style and the mechanics of writing, we see a lot of errors in basic grammatical rules like active and passive voice, um, basic errors in punctuation, commas, colons, semicolons, um, paraphrasing, quoting, and citing sources. Um, so maybe not providing the proper context or not formatting these properly. Uh, we see a lot of students um, uh, submitting papers that we would consider sort of choppy or disjointed in the sense that they don't really uh, offer an appropriate introduction, they don't conclude properly, they don't include transitions to sort of glue everything together. Um, so that's a common thing that we see when working with our students. Um, and we also, um, as I sort of alluded to earlier, uh, we often see students struggling to um, use APA's heading levels as organizing elements for their manuscript. Um, in fact, I had a student from Michigan State this morning sent me her chapter two uh, and her theoretical framework. Uh, and her instructor said, you know, you really need to use heading levels to help organize your content better. And she she said, I just don't understand because I used a level one heading and I used a level two heading. I think I'm using them correctly. So I opened the document and sure enough, she had theoretical framework as her level one heading, which was fine. And then she had uh, the the name of her theory, one of her theories as level uh, level two heading, which is also fine. And then 11 pages of text followed without any other headings, right? So you can imagine as the reader, right, that that just kind of looks like a wall of text, right? There's no visual cues there to sort of help someone follow your line of thinking. Um, we'll talk more about this a little bit later, but um, that's definitely something that we see. Um, and then the last thing is not learning APA style. Um, I add this here because, um, the APA manual is $43. Um, and while I know it can be a little scary to think about opening it and learning it, um, it's so beneficial for you as a, uh, as a graduate, as a doctoral student. Um, and I can tell you from working with thousands and thousands of students on their dissertations that on the back end, 
for students that don't learn APA style, for students that don't apply these guidelines to their writing, an average dissertation can cost anywhere from $1,250 to $1,500 to edit in compliance with APA style um, or more, depending on the, the length and the complexity and the condition of the document. Um, and it's just because it's a very tedious and time consuming process. Um, the APA manual is 427 pages, and as you'll learn over the next 90 minutes, there is a rule for pretty much everything. Um, so I don't say that to scare you. I say that more as an encouragement to just take little bits of APA at a time, maybe break it up uh, into, into chapters and then decide, okay, this month I'm going to focus on chapter one and I'm going to break up the whatever, let's say 25 pages of chapter one into a couple pages a week or whatever. Um, and before too long, you'll pick up these guidelines and really be able to self-edit your own work. Um, so we already talked about this in terms of why APA style matters, but again, really the focus was to help readers to focus on the heart of a manuscript. And I'm sure all of you have had the experience of maybe a peer review or getting an email from someone that's really poorly edited or written, and it's really hard to read and understand what the writer is actually trying to convey. And again, that's really the reason that APA style was developed. Um, it's really to help readers focus on what matters most to you. And that's your message and the positive difference that you want to make in the community. So again, I go back to this question, how do you want to change the world as a writer? So we're going to get into the nitty gritty of APA here. Um, I, I know that this is a very um, technical presentation. Uh, my husband, Dennis, is a professional facilitator, and he is more of like a TED Talk style presenter. Um, and he looked at my slides at one point and he goes, well, you know, honey, th th it's it's not a TED talk. And I said, well, yes, but I think it's rather inspiring. And I don't think it would be very effective to teach APA with like inspirational pictures of people climbing mountains or like random light bulbs on a, on a screen, right? Like we need to have uh, more content so that you all can use these slides as a supplement to the, uh, to the manual. So um, in any case, this is a very, very technical presentation. I know that um, it's probably gonna feel a little bit overwhelming, but hopefully uh, more clarifying than not. Um, I also want this to be as interactive as we can possibly make it. So if there are questions, um, I will stop periodically and check in with John Strickland to see if any questions have come in. Um, and there, there is no such thing as a bad question. Um, every question is a good question. If you ask it, I'm, I guarantee you there's someone else in the room that probably was thinking something similar. Um, so if you have anything like that that you'd like clarified, please feel free uh, to let us know. Um, okay, so uh, starting off here, this is the uh, sample student title page uh, that was released in the seventh edition of the APA manual. Uh, and you'll you'll see here, if you're if you were used to working in APA 6, you'll see that the probably the most noticeable thing is that there is not a running head in the upper left-hand corner anymore. Um, there is, however, a page number still in the upper right-hand corner uh, in the header section of the paper. Um, the title for the uh, for the paper should be sort of in the upper third of the page. Uh, this is also a shift from the sixth edition, this title is in bold font um, and in what's called title case, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, and then the uh, name of the student, their department and university, their course uh, abbreviation and number and the name of the course should be included as well as the students, uh, excuse me, the instructor's name in the uh, format that the instructor prefers, and then the month, day, and year that the assignment is due. Um, now, this title page is really intended for course papers. So Johnson University, like many institutions, has its own formatting guidelines um, for the final dissertation. Um, so for your dissertation, your title page is going to look different, but this is this is what you would use for a typical sort of course uh, course paper. Um, if at some point you uh, were submitting research to a journal for publication, um, maybe you're you're uh, either doing that on your own or maybe uh, co-publishing with a, a faculty member at Johnson or elsewhere. This uh, this would be the, the title page that you would use. So this is the sample uh, professional title page that was released in the seventh edition. You can see here that the running head is included in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, it's a, a shortened version of the title in all capital letters. Uh, and you'll see there that the page number is included in the upper right-hand corner. 
Um, the, again, the title is in sort of the upper third of the page in bold font. The names of the authors should be included there in order of authorship, along with the author's uh, department and university information. And those superscript numerals are there to indicate the affiliation between the author um, and their department and university. So you can see the, the superscript numeral one after my name, and then it's connected to my uh, not real department and university name. And then for the professional title page, you also include an author note, and this includes the names of the authors in order of authorship indented one half inch from the left hand margin. And this also includes the ORCID ID after the author's name. Um, it kind of is like a DOI for an author. Um, it's a place where sort of all of their scholarship is stored, uh, any changes of affiliation, um, name changes, things like that would be all uh, located sort of in that, uh, in that place. Um, but on the professional title page, um, you do wanna include any changes of affiliation for those authors, if anything like that um, has uh, occurred during during the, the writing of the publication, um, any conflicts of interest to disclose would be presented next, and then contact information for the corresponding author uh, would come last. Um, so one of the other things that we saw in the seventh edition that was new for APA was uh, a, a longer list of permissible fonts. Um, so I know I've been using Times New Roman 12, uh, 12 point font for as long as I've been typing. Um, and so this was really the first time that APA uh, came forward and said, you know, there's there's other fonts that uh, that really are accessible to all users that are permitted in APA style as of the seventh edition. Um, so these include 12 point Times New Roman, 11 point Georgia or 10 point Computer Modern. Uh, and then you can also use sans serif fonts, including 11 point Calibri, 11 point Arial, or 10 point Lucida Sans Unicode. Um, and then if you're putting figures together, APA recommends an 18 to 14 point type size. Um, with tables, it's uh, typical to use the same font uh, type uh, for, a, for a table, though it's uh, often necessary to reduce the size of the font a little bit um, just to kind of uh, keep that that table um, on one page. Uh, you do when you are putting tables together, though, you want to make sure that you don't go much smaller than uh, maybe nine or 10 point font just so that you can ensure that your reader can actually read it. Um, and for uh, for tables that are really extensive, there's always the option of, of shifting to a, a landscape uh, style page instead of a portrait style page, but we'll talk about um, tables and figures a little bit more later. Um, the uh, a couple other important things to note is that the same font and font color should be used throughout the text of a manuscript for consistency. So if you're someone who kind of toggles back and forth between Google and Word, believe it or not, the, the shades of black are not the same. So uh, you do want to make sure that on a final document that you maybe do a select all uh, within a Word document and make sure that all of the, the um, font color is the same. Um, and then these fonts have all been recommended because they are, um, they're legible and they're widely available across word processing systems. Um, I don't know if any of you have had this experience, but if you were to select a non-typical font and send that document to somebody who doesn't have that font on their computer, Word is just going to revert to whatever it wants to revert to. So you could end up with a dissertation uh, in the hands of a committee member that has some like curly Q font that is impossible to read. So that's one of the, the reasons why these uh, these fonts are important to adhere to. These also include math symbols and Greek letters. So if, for example, you are uh, presenting results in a chapter four, you want to make sure that there's consistency uh, in the text that you use, um, both for the, the text of the manuscript, but also for math symbols or Greek letters if they are used. Um, the first line of a paragraph should be indented by one half inch from the left hand margin using the tab key, um, not the space bar. I cannot tell you how many uh, how many hours we spend um, undoing spacebar indents and adding tab indents. Um, it's pretty hard to get the tab key to exactly half of a half an inch and have that be consistent throughout the manuscript. Um, so definitely use um, the tab key that should default to a half an inch within your word processing system. Um, and unless you are advised otherwise, um, margins should be set to one inch at the top bottom left and right, and the text should be left justified, which means it's straight on the left-hand side and jagged on the right. 
Um, there should also be no extra spaces between paragraphs or between headings and paragraphs unless requested by the campus or the publisher. Um, this is not true at Johnson, but some campuses do have uh, headings where they want a little, little extra space before or after headings or whatever. So if that's requested by a publisher, then, then certainly align uh, your document to those expectations. But um, generally speaking, the APA standard is to not have any extra spaces uh, throughout the document. Everything should simply be double spaced. Okay, I talked, um, actually we'll uh, pause real quick. I'll see, uh, check in with John to see if there are any questions. We have several, hold on just one second. Okay. This might not be exactly a question just for Sarah, but more for institutional preferences. I know that there, that APA 7 allows for more fonts, but do we have an institutional preference for the research proposal and dissertation that it stay at a certain font. Yeah, comics stand. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, our, our standard is not 9 12 Times New Roman 12 point for the recording. Who's, who said Comic Sans? Who do you think said Comic Sans? Dr. Beard. Absolutely. Good to see. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna I'm just gonna have to cancel right out of this presentation and go, go to the beach or something. <laughs> Comic Sans is never permitted. I actually, it's funny, I worked at a campus once where the marketing and communications office actually had a sign when you walked in that said, I, I vow to never use Comic Sans in a professional document. <laughs> so I have a picture of myself signing it. <laughs> okay, Times New Roman it is. Other questions? That may have been it. Okay. Okay. Um, so this here in front of us is the uh, the heading structure in APA style. Um, APA has five heading levels. Um, the level one heading uh, is centered, bold, and in title case. Uh, title case is uh, when all major words are capitalized. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and then text begins as a new paragraph, one double space below that level one heading. Um, now in APA style, all of these heading levels are nested underneath the heading that comes above it. So if you have a section with a level one heading, which would be a main section of your, uh, of your paper, uh, and you wanted to break that section into subheadings, you would use a level two heading to label those subsections within, uh, within that section with a level one heading. Um, then if you had a section with a level two heading and you wanted to break that into subsections, you would use a level three heading and so on. So um, you don't ever shift from a level one to a level three or a level three to a level five just because you want to and it looks pretty. Um, it's not, it, it really is uh, intended to follow like an outline structure and indicate to the reader sort of the level of significance of the heading within the overall organizational structure of your paper. Um, so I tend to think about academic uh, papers or chapters sort of in terms of like, what are what are the main buckets in this chapter? And those main buckets, right, those sort of main uh, areas of content, that might be your theoretical framework, that might be um, your uh, an overview of your participants, right, How, however you, you structure your paper, um, those major buckets are going to be marked by the level one heading. Um, and then the next uh, level heading within that section would then be a level two heading. And the reason that these are important, as I kind of alluded to earlier, is that you want to take your reader on a journey with you, right? We often think of writing as sort of this solitary uh, endeavor and one that often requires a lot of, uh, you know, deadlines and a certain number of pages and everything else. But we really, it, it's a very collaborative process. And so when we're thinking about putting a chapter together, we also need to be thinking about who's reading this and are they able to follow my line of thinking? And the heading levels provide those guideposts or those visual cues to help the reader follow along. And it also helps us to stay on track, of course, as we're writing. Um, I personally think it's very beneficial to lay out as much as you can of your heading structure before you even start writing a chapter, because it ensures that you're able to think about the logical organization of your ideas and whether your ideas all flow together. Of course, this makes it easier to then transition from one set of ideas to another because there's a logical uh, flow and organization to uh, to that heading structure. Um, I've, I've even seen students go through and write a 
you know, thesis or topic sentence for each section of their chapter before they ever start writing, right? Really to make sure that everything logically flows from the beginning to the end. So there's a lot of ways that you can use this to your advantage. Um, one of the things that we see most often when students submit a, dis a dissertation chapter, a chapter to us after it's been reviewed by a committee member, um, often students will say, I sent this, I wrote chapter two, I sent it to my committee member, they wrote me back and they said it was super disorganized and they can't follow it. And almost every time it's because the student opened their word processing system and just started writing and didn't put any thought ahead of time into kind of what the structure of the chapter should look like before they before they sit down to write. And so usually to get the chapter where it needs to be, we sort of have to go backwards, <laughs> create an outline and then sort of start moving the content. Uh, the student has to start moving that content into the, the structure that they've created. Um, I mentioned that the title, the titles uh, or the headings, excuse me, are in title case um, and in title case, um, all verbs and pronouns are capitalized. Um, so even little verbs like is and are. Um, words with four letters or more are capitalized, including prepositions. So you can see here in these headings where it says ending with a period. So this is a heading, right? And this word right here is a preposition and that is capitalized. That is about probably the opposite of what most of us learned when we were in grade school. Um, but in APA style, these words are in fact capitalized. This would even apply to uh, a title like the Americans with Disabilities Act, you would capitalize that W. So words like between, through, from, and so on in titles and headings would be capitalized. Um, in title case, both parts of a hyphenated compound are also capitalized. Um, a, co a hyphenated compound, also referred to as a compound adjective, are when two words are paired together to modify a noun. So let's say you were talking about first generation students. Uh, and using that in a title or heading, both the F and the G would be capitalized in that title or heading, right? So both parts, not just the F. So this is how this looks in practice. So here is, you have the, let's say the title of your chapter, the title of a paper, your introductory text, uh, your first major heading would be a level one heading, and then you would break up um, into subsections. If you wanted to break it into um, subsections, you would use a level two heading. The other kind of quirky thing about APA style, well, there's lots of quirky things about APA style, but one is that the recommendation from APA is to not use the heading introduction um, before your introductory text. It's assumed that that, that, that is the introduction. Um, so you should just have the title of the chapter or the title of the paper that you're writing, your introductory text, and then your first major section in the paper. Um, and then the other thing that is quirky about APA is that you should never have only one subsection in a section because it sort of uh, wouldn't make sense to just break a section into only one subsection. So APA's guidance is to break it into two subsections if in fact you're going to do that. Um, and then this is what it would look like with a level three heading if you were to use that to break up a section with a level two heading. This is what it would look like with a level four heading to break up a section with a level three heading. And this is what it would look like to use a level five heading to break up a section with a level four heading. So you can see again, these are all nested underneath the heading that comes above. So all of this right here is all still part of the section with the level one heading. Okay. So we're going to um, dive into uh, writing style and grammar. Um, there is a lot of content in here. We're also going to talk about the mechanics of style. And again, this is a very, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of technical information. Um, so in this section, we're going to talk about transitions. We're going to talk about subordinate conjunctions, anthropomorphism, verb tenses, active and passive voice, subject verb agreement, and pronouns. Okay, so first, um, transitional words and phrases are words that can really help us to improve continuity, continuity and flow in our writing. Um, and we use these between sentences, paragraphs, and ideas um, really to avoid choppiness um, and to ensure uh, that text is smooth and clear rather than abrupt or disjointed. And there's a number of different types of transitional words and phrases that we can use. Um, uh, and really the, the goal here is to sort of demonstrate to the reader what the logical connection is between two ideas. Um, so we can use time links, uh, cause and effect links, addition links, 
contrast links and many, many more types, but this just gives you kind of an example of the types of words that can be used to really help us connect our ideas, make a logical, uh, uh, demonstrate the logical relationship between ideas and also help us with the flow and cadence of our writing. Um, now we have, uh, because we, of course, work with students who are also sort of navigating their dissertation committees. Um, we have certainly come across uh, students who will tell us, well, I have I have a committee member who wanted me to re remove all of the transitional words and phrases because they thought that they were distracting. Um, and then somebody else on the same committee says, you know, your writing is kind of choppy. It would be helpful if you had some transitional words and phrases. So you can see how, um, how uh, you know, just navigating the relationship with your uh, committee and their expectations can, uh, can, of course, create some challenges. But I would just recommend um, using these judiciously. Make sure that you are selecting transitional words and phrases uh, when you are actually needing to uh, demonstrate a logical relationship between two ideas. Um, these really help to cue the reader into understanding what, what um, connections you want them to make about your work. Um, subordinate conjunctions uh, include the words uh, since, while, although, because, and whereas as examples, and these introduce subordinate clauses. Um, it's really important that we select subordinate conjunctions with care. Um, one of the things that is uh, exceptionally important about academic writing is that we be as precise and clear as possible. Um, and so uh, two words that we see misused probably the most are the words while and since uh, when they do not refer strictly to time. And this can, of course, create confusion. Um, I would say probably as high as nine times out of 10, the word while is misused in academic writing. Um, we often start sentences with while, while, blah, 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 when we really mean although, um, because while would assume that two events are occurring simultaneously, which most of the time, uh, that's not how students use uh, the word while. Um, the word since, oops, sorry. On my screen, I can see myself in the room, but I can't, it's fine. We'll, we'll work through it. It's just the joys of, of zooming in uh, to a live space. Um, so I wanted to real quick to say that in, uh, in lieu of the word while, if you do see this in your writing, um, the words although, despite, and, or but can be used instead. Um, and then the other word is the word since. So since could mean from a time in the past. Uh, like I haven't had anything to eat since breakfast, um, but usually we mean because. Usually we are not using the word since in a in a time uh, time related manner. So these are two words that you can kind of check for um, throughout your writing that usually are used incorrectly. Um, the next thing we'll chat about is anthropomorphism, and this is the attribution of human characteristics to non-human or inanimate entities. Um, so our role as writers should be to pair active verbs with human actors whenever possible. So this is really the goal. Um, in the sixth edition of the APA manual, the guidance was a little bit ambiguous. Um, and so there was sort of a, a, a good amount of over editing for anthropomorphism up to the release of the seventh edition, um, because really any time an editor or a faculty member or a dissertation director would see an, uh, an active verb paired with a non-human actor, we would count that as anthropomorphism and ask the student to rewrite the sentence to avoid uh, this academic writing error. In the seventh edition, they sort of loosened the guidance on this a little bit and they wrote uh, many acceptable constructions and widespread use do not constitute anthropomorphism because they do not impede understanding or mislead readers. Um, so the acceptable constructions that they uh, included were this section addresses, the chapter focuses on, the results suggest, the data provide, the research contributes to, the study found, and so on. Um, and I will own that prior to the release of the seventh edition, if a st student had written the study found, I would have said, well, not really, right? Like the study can't actually do the finding of the data, right? Who, who actually does that? Um, and I would have asked the student to rewrite the sentence to focus on pairing a human actor with that active verb. But as you can see, uh, there are a lot of things that we say in academic writing that are um, that you know don't impede understanding. They don't mislead re uh, mislead readers. We know what the the writer is trying to convey, um, and so these uh, these types of constructions have uh, have gotten a sort of a pass from APA. Um, I really like this example. I think this is really helpful in kind of thinking about uh, anthropomorphism within your own writing. Um, so the 
uh, APA provides the example the theory addresses, which they would consider correct. Um, a theory can, in fact, address something. Um, but to say that the theory concludes would be incorrect because a theory can't make a conclusion. So the question that we often ask uh, our students and ourselves when we're doing this work is, is it reasonable to expect that this subject could perform this particular action? And if the answer is yes, you're probably fine. If the answer is no, that doesn't, that's not logical, that doesn't make sense, um, then the recommendation would be to rewrite uh, the sentence uh, to avoid anthropomorphism. Um, I'll get through verb tenses and then I'll stop for questions because we usually get uh, quite a few questions about uh, about verb tenses. But um, verb tenses are an interesting area of, an, of academic writing because we tend to hear a lot of sort of absolute guidance about uh, what should be in what tense and what chapter, for example. Um, and if you follow it in very black and white, you can sometimes end up with a chapter that actually doesn't make any sense because you have every single sentence written in exactly the same tense without really considering the context of, of what you're writing about and what would be the most appropriate. Um, so APA's guidance uh, on verb tenses is as follows. Uh, the literature review uh, should be in past or present perfect um, meaning that you can use either past or present perfect in the literature review or anytime you are discussing another researcher's work. So that could be in the introduction, in the method section, in chapter four, in chapter five. Anytime you're discussing another researcher's work, you want to be in past or present perfect. And I'll talk about the distinction between those two in a moment. Um, when you are putting your research proposal together, you want to be in future tense for any, any time you're indicating what you will do in the future. Right. So uh, when I mentioned that I, we sometimes hear this sort of absolute guidance, you know, sometimes a student will tell us, well, I was told to put my entire research proposal in future tense. So they put the entire research proposal in future tense. Right. However, if you're referring to the literature that somebody uh, published in the past, well, that wouldn't make sense. Right. You would want that to be in past tense because that's when, let's say, Saldana published whatever whatever it was right so um, you just want to make sure that you keep the context in mind when you're deciding on the tenses to use um, once you've completed your study uh, the the uh, recommendation is to then shift your uh, chapter three or your method section to past or present perfect we should use past tense when we're reporting our results, and we should use present tense when we're discussing the implications of our results, the conclusions, the limitations, the future directions, and so forth. And the idea really is that um, this helps to kind of situate the reader in the here and now so that they can consider how the results of the study um, uh, should be considered in terms of implications for maybe policy, practice, and so on. So let's look at the distinction between um, past tense and present perfect. So um, past tense is appropriate when expressing an action or a condition that occurred at a specific definite time. So this is what you want to remember when deciding to use past tense. The specific definite part is the key here, um, such as when you're discussing another researcher's work. So for example, in a study on factors that support doctoral student writing, Henry 2020 found so whatever that verb is, it's going to be in past tense, found, opined, suggested, noted, discovered, whatever it is, past tense, right? Because it happened at a distinct, definite, specific point in time in the past. Now, the present perfect tense is appropriate, appropriate to express a past action or condition that did not occur at a specific definite time or to describe an action beginning in the past and continuing to the present. So you might follow that first example with this sentence. Since then, many researchers have explored the differences between. So let's say at the end of this sentence, you were gonna cite several different authors that have all explored the differences between blah, blah, blah. So you don't have a, a specific definite time, right? You have four or five maybe different times when this work was, was conducted. So in that case, you would switch to present perfect. Okay, let's pause there for a second. Um, any questions? Uh, what tense should be used in an abstract? Oh gosh, that's a great question. Um, again, it would be it would be context specific. Generally, I would say pa past tense. 
once the study has been conducted. Any other, any other questions before we continue? Don, I'm good. with you walking up the aisles like that, I'm gonna call you like Phil Donahue or something. Or, or Oprah. <laughs> hey, I've been called worse. <laughs> we can go on at one question per break. You're going to finish early. Oh, well, heck, there you go. Okay. Um, That's not so, an invitation to make her finish early. <laughs> Keep asking good, good questions. Good questions. You know, we have a lot to cover. Don't worry. We have a lot to cover. Um, okay. So active and passive voice is another place where we see sort of a lot of absolute guidance. Um, uh, active voice is preferred in academic writing. Um, and I just wanted to share just a quick uh recap of sort of what the difference is between the two. So um, in active voice, the subject of a sentence is presented first, followed by the verb and then the object of the verb. Uh, so that would look like this, students completed the questionnaires. So students is the subject, completed is the verb, the questionnaires is the object. In passive voice, it's reversed. So the object precedes the verb and the verb precedes the subject. So the subject comes at the end of the sentence. Um, or you might have a sentence like the questionnaires were completed, period, by whom. So the, the option to add sort of by who were, by who were they whom were they completed at the end of the sentence would indicate that you're in passive voice. So that's a, a good way to kind of tell that you're in passive voice is by use of the word by with that subject at the end of the sentence. Um, so believe it or not, and contrary to what many uh, many students hear, um, both active and passive voices are permitted in APA style. Um, many writers do overuse passive voice. And so whenever possible, you do want to try to use active voice, especially when it's important to know who performed the action. Um, so active voice is considered more direct, more succinct, more focused. These are all things that are important for um, academic writing, um, but just know that uh, they're, they are both technically permitted and it is of course, in, in a dissertation length document, for example, it's you're not going to have the same sentence structure all the way through the entire dissertation. So um, it is normal to vary your sentence structure so that you can, uh, you know, in, uh, improve your your flow and your cadence of your ideas uh, sort of throughout the chapter. It makes it more compelling to read, um, but you do want to really focus on active voice as much as possible. Um, in terms of subject and verb agreement, uh, just as a quick reminder that a verb must agree in number with its subject and clarified in the seventh edition was that uh, this is true even if there is an intervening phrase. So as an example, the percentage of correct responses as well as the speed of the responses increases with practice. So percentage is the subject, increases is the verb. That's where that subject verb agreement needs to happen even though that intervening phrase is there. There's some more on subject and verb agreement. Um, so you can follow up on this in the manual. There's some information on collective nouns, use of the word none, and compound subjects joined by or or nor. All right, let's go ahead and look at pronouns. So this has also been a very significant shift um, since the time I first learned academic writing. Um, I remember distinctly being told never, ever, ever use I in an academic paper, ever. Um, now it's completely the opposite. It's, it's literally 180 degree change uh, from where it was uh, way back when. So um, APA's guidance is now to use first person rather than third person when describing work we did as part of our research and when expressing our own views. Um, APA advises that we not use the word we to refer to ourselves if we are a single author without co-authors. You might ask, why would someone do that? Well, um, it's very easy when you're writing a dissertation to slip into thinking of you and your committee members as uh, writing a big group project. <laughs> um, so it's common for us to see we in dissertations um, because often students are thinking about themselves in conversation with their committee. Um, but it's just important to remember that the dissertation of course is a single author paper. Um, we also should not refer to ourselves and our co-authors in the third person as the authors or the researchers. In this case, we would use the word we. So if you were writing a paper with someone else, that would apply. Um, and we also should avoid using what's referred to as the editorial we to refer to people in general. So an example of this would be 
we must implement change in nursing or education or leadership to blah, blah, blah. Um, and really, we see a lot of this in chapter five, when we tend to be, uh, you know, thinking big about how the results of our research uh, might uh, influence a particular community. Um, and so we, we start to see these sort of lofty statements without there being an uh, appropriate reference established. So uh, the uh, recommendation would be if you are going to use we that you make sure that you um, make it clear to the reader uh, who you're referring to. So as nurse practitioners, we must blah, blah, blah. As educators, we must blah, blah, blah. Um, so just making sure to clarify that we. The singular they has um, also been formally adopted in APA style. Uh, APA writes that the use of the singular they is inclusive of all people, helps writers avoid making assumptions about gender and is part of APA style. Um, so the recommendation is to use the singular they to refer to those who use they as their pronoun or to refer to someone whose gender is unknown or irrelevant to the context, which is most of the time. The other reason this is important is because we, we often, um, inject the potential for reader bias related to gender when we use gendered pronouns. So that's the other reason why um, this is an important thing to adopt. Um, for example, if you were, um, uh, if you had found a study that I had written, but you had never met me before and didn't know anything about me, um, you might make the assumption because my name is Sarah, that I use she, her pronouns, which may or may not be true. Um, so the recommendation in APA would be to write Henry 2021 wrote blah, blah, blah in their study rather than in her study. Um, because again, by introducing that gendered pronoun, we, uh, we introduce the possibility that the reader could, uh, could have bias related to gender in considering the results of that particular author. The recommendation is also to avoid he or she as generic third person pronouns. And before we use these pronouns, we should ensure they match the pronouns of the people we are describing. And if we do not know, or we are unsure, we should use they instead or rewrite the sentence to avoid unintentional or harmful implications. Um, so some of the writing strategies we can use include rephrasing, using plural nouns or plural pronouns, replacing the pronoun with an article or dropping the pronoun altogether. And there's a really, really helpful chart on page 121 that outlines some different considerations in using gender biased versus gender neutral language just to um, give you another resource for kind of checking if this is something that you um, you think is maybe a, a common practice within your own writing. Related to uh, pronouns for both people and non-human subjects, we often see a lot of errors in uh, students using who versus that inappropriately. Um, so relative pronouns, of course, introduce subordinate clauses linked to nouns. Um, and APA's guidance is to use who for human beings and that for non-human animals or inanimate objects. So uh, this is correct. So students and faculty who attended the webinar, what we often see is students and faculty that attended the webinar. So you just want to make sure when you're using a relative pronoun to refer back to people or a person that you use who instead of that. Um, this would be an example of uh, the relative pronoun that this is also correct. Generally, we don't see errors in this because most people would not think to write the webinar who provided an overview, for example. Okay, and then pronouns and restrictive and non restrictive clauses are also very specific in APA style and um, this is not true of other style manuals, but it is true of APA and there is a specific difference between using the word that versus which as a relative pronoun. Um, and uh, that that clauses are also referred to as restrictive clauses and these are considered essential to the meaning of the sentence, so an example would be I presented a webinar on APA style that covers the essential guidelines in the manual. So in that example, the writer wants you to know that not only did they present a webinar in APA style, it was specifically the webinar in APA style that covers the essential guidelines in the manual. So the text that follows the word that is essential to understanding the webinar. Now, a which clause, um, also referred to as a non-restrictive or non-essential clause, um, adds further information, but is not essential to the meaning of the sentence. So you might have a sentence like, I presented a webinar on APA style to students and faculty. That really could stand alone as a sentence. Um, but the writer, if you as the writer want the reader to know that there is more information that you want to sort of supplement this with, then you would, do a, you would write a comma, the word which, 
uh, and then which was one of the highlights of my professional career. So whatever that sort of supplementary information is that you want to add. When we're working on a document, we actually use the find feature to look for every instance of the word which within a, a document. Um, and I would say probably seven times out of 10 that they are used incorrectly. So this is definitely an, an area uh, to check for in your writing. Um, if you are using the word which at the start of a non-restrictive clause, it should be preceded by a comma. And that's a, a mistake that we comment, uh, we often uh, catch and correct in dissertations. Um, there's some more on writing style and grammar um, in this part of the manual. So um, there's more information on continuity and flow, conciseness and clarity, contractions and colloquialism, misplaced and dangling modifiers, wordiness and redundancy, parallel construction and tone and mood. I have uh, presented on the full APA 7 manual um, one time. It took me six hours. So I, the reason I say that is because you're, you're really getting all of the essentials today, but there is certainly more in the, uh, in the uh, manual for you to follow up on uh, in your own time. Um, 90 minutes is is good for uh, for the essentials, but um, with a 427 page manual, there are, there's certainly a lot to a lot to cover. Um, on that note, we're going to just talk very briefly about the bias free language guidelines, but we're not going to go into depth on these. Um, so the bias free language guidelines, I think, are one of the more um, important things that APA does as an organization, um, really to encourage authors to write about people with inclusivity and respect. And this is a really important aspect of making sure that you're writing uh, without bias uh, and with as much clarity as possible in your writing. Um, so just as a quick uh, recap, um, in the seventh edition, the guidance on age, disability, gender, racial and ethnic identity, and sexual orientation was updated, and new guidance was offered on socioeconomic status and intersectionality. Um, and I really love this quote from APA. So APA writes, APA is committed to both the advancement of science and the fair treatment of individuals and groups. Language changes over time, and it is important to use the terms that individuals and or communities use to describe themselves, their experiences, and their practices. So a couple notes on why this is important. Um, uh, we, of course, want to demonstrate respect for participants and readers alike. Um, it's very important in academic writing to be as specific and precise as possible. And when we do this, we contribute to the goal of accurate and unbiased communication. Um, we also want our readers to see themselves in our work and to feel included in our work and discussed in ways that promote their own agency and identity. Um, so this is a very important part of, uh, of academic writing. Um, some general guidelines include uh, making sure that we're using descriptors that are relevant to our research and writing, recognizing participants' intersectionality is appropriate, not overgeneralizing in our writing or in our research, um, Remembering that labels change over time, uh, it's important that we be mindful uh, to avoid inappropriate terms when referring to individuals or groups. Uh, these guidelines are not rigid. So as you're reading the uh, chapter five, which I encourage all of you to do is to, to actually go in and read the bias free language guidelines. Um, just know that these guidelines are not rigid. Um, it's very possible in the time that we have the seventh edition that language will advance in ways that are not reflected in the guidelines and uh, will maybe not be updated until the eighth edition. Um, I joke with my team that I'm going to retire before the eighth edition comes out because I don't know that I can handle another transition. Um, but just remember to always make a good uh, use good judgment when thinking about uh, the terminology you use to refer to individuals and groups. Um, we should, of course, avoid the use of pejorative or stigmatizing terms, um, even if participants use these to describe themselves. So. Um, if you're conducting a qualitative study, for example, and a participant um, uses a word that would be considered pejorative or stigmatizing, um, it's okay to keep that in the quote because that is authentic to their experience and their perspective, but we wouldn't want to then take that word and refer to them using that term later on um, in the paper. Um, and of course, we want to avoid terminology that is inflammatory or degrading. Um, so again, I would recommend um, reading chapter five. Um, it would take a, probably a full hour to get through all of the content, but there's really important information about how we refer to, uh, how we talk about age, how we talk about sexual orientation, how we talk about race and ethnicity, right? So there's a lot of, a lot of nuances to consider specifically related um, to these guidelines. I'm gonna pause real quick to see if there are any questions before we continue.
John, do you see any? Nope, I think we're good. No questions, okay. Um, so let's take a look at the mechanics of style. So um, this, uh, there's a lot of very technical information in here, but all things that are really intended to help you present your best work. So we're gonna talk about spacing after punctuation marks, periods, commas, and semicolons, dashes and quotation marks, hyphenation and capitalization and numbers. So the first, the first thing right, right off the bat here is what has been a very heated debate over the last probably 10 to 15 years, and that is the one space versus two space debate. I'm sure all of you are probably familiar with it, and you already probably know too what your, uh, either your preferences or uh, what you've been taught. Um, but in the seventh edition, APA uh, did, uh, did finally uh, formalize their guidance that one space after a period or other punctuation marks is considered APA style. Um, we should also insert one space uh, after commas, colons, and semicolons, after periods that separate parts of a reference list entry and periods following the initials in names. Um, so one space is, um, is appropriate. Um, believe it or not, two spaces uh, after a period is considered a formatting error. Um, it is very challenging to find a, a print document anytime in the last like five to 10 years where there are two spaces after a period. Not that there aren't any, but this is really, this transition has um, started. Um, sorry, my, I have a, a, my dog is in here and she heard a person walk by. So of course she wants to start barking right now. Um, uh, so just know that the two spaces after a period is, uh, uh, is, an, uh, is an error at this point. And really the shift has occurred due to advances in technology and word processing systems. Um, I joke that when I learned two spaces after a period, I was on one of the earliest Apple computers with the black background and the green text playing the organ trail. That's how long ago that was. So clearly things have, uh, have advanced since then. Um, and the one space after a period thing is definitely here to stay. Um, okay, so let's take a look at periods. So um, we should use a period or periods to end a complete sentence, of course, um, with the initials in names. So for example, S period, K period, Henry. And when we do use the initials uh, before a person's last name, there should be a space um, between those initials. Um, and in the abbreviations for United States and United Kingdom, when they are used as an adjective. We also use periods in reference abbreviations. So volume one, for example, second edition, page six and paragraphs 11 through 12. So VOL period one here is the abbreviation for volume. Uh, ED period with the lowercase e would be the abbreviation for an edition number if you were including that after the title of a book, for example. Uh, if you were including a page number after a direct quote, this is the appropriate format with a P period, a space, and then the page number. Um, and then the appropriate abbreviation for a paragraph would be P-A-R-A, -A, uh, period, if you're using a single paragraph. Um, for example, in a, a quote from a source, uh, an online source specifically, you might, um, you might need to include the location information for a direct quote. Usually in an online source, there are not page numbers, so we have to use a paragraph number to indicate the location of that quote within the source. Um, so if you are including a quote from one paragraph, it would be P-A-R-A -A period, and then a space, and then that paragraph number. And then if you were including a quote that was maybe across multiple paragraphs, you would uh, use the abbreviation P-A-R-A-S period, and then a space, and then the paragraph range. Um, we do not use periods in abbreviations of state, province, or territory names. So like Washington, D.C., for example, in capital letter abbreviations, um, or in the abbreviations for academic degrees. Uh, and we also do not use periods after URLs or DOIs in the reference list. So this is a retrieval issue when you're working within your reference list. Um, you wanna make sure that those, if you have periods at the end of DOIs or URLs that you remove them. Um, if somebody, for example, were to uh, copy that and paste it into a browser, it would not take them to the source because that period is there um, and is not actually part of the address. Um, a couple notes on comma use. So APA is an Oxford comma style. Um, I have been using the Oxford comma for as long as I can remember. And I um, recently was hired to do some editing for a national foundation um, that uses AP style, which is what a lot of newspapers use. Um, and they are not an Oxford comma style. And I spent 
uh, several hours over 25 pages removing Oxford commas, which really uh, was quite painful for <laughs> painful for me given that I just don't agree with that as a as a, a punctuation rule but um but it is what it is and uh but it is interesting how the the language of APA versus the language of another style manual can really it can feel sort of disorienting when you switch from one to the other um but APA is an Oxford comma style and that uh uh, the example here is the cat comma, the dog comma, and the mouse. So that highlighted comma there is the Oxford comma. It's the comma that precedes the conjunction in a series of three or more items. Um, we also use a comma after an introductory phrase at the beginning of a sentence uh, to set off a non-essential or non-restrictive clause. That's the which clause that we talked about earlier. Um, and to separate two independent clauses joined by a conjunction. So if you have two independent clauses that could stand alone as a sentence, uh, and you wanted to join them with a, a conjunction, the conjunction would be preceded by a comma. Um, we also use a comma to set off the year and exact dates in the text or in a retrieval date, to set off the year in parenthetical citations, which we'll talk more about in a little bit, and then to separate groups of three digits in most numbers of 1,000 or more. Um, and then semicolons um, should be used to separate two independent clauses not joined by a conjunction. So if you have two independent clauses uh, that you want to join together because there is a relationship between them, but you're, you're not uh, including a conjunction, you would separate those independent clauses by a semicolon. Um, you can also use a semicolon when joining two independent clauses with a conjunctive adverb, which are words like however, therefore, and nevertheless. Um, in this case, the semicolon would follow the first independent clause, then you would have the conjunctive adverb, then a comma, and then the second clause. Um, semicolons are also used to separate lists in a, uh, items in a list that already contain commas. So this can be a little bit tricky, but if you look at this list, um, I'm treating this list as having three independent items. So I presented on the mechanics of style, that's item number one, bias-free language related to age, gender, and socioeconomic status, that's item number two, and citations and references, which is item number three. Now, because the second item here in this list contains internal commas, we use semicolons in between each of those items within the series. And the same logic applies to how we structure parenthetical citations within the paper. So you can see here, we would order, we would organize parenthetical citations by the, um, an author's last name, a comma, and then the year, and then we would separate those with a semicolon. We'll talk more about citations in just a bit. Um, we also use a semicolon to separate different types of information in the same set of parentheses to avoid back-to-back -back parentheses. So in APA style, we don't use back-to-back -back parentheses or nested parentheses. So um, one trick is to use the find feature uh, in Word. The find feature will be your, uh, your best friend um, because you really can, if you identify a mistake, you can use the find feature to locate it throughout your entire paper. Um, so you can always use the find feature to look for back-to-back -back parentheses and that adjacent information would need to be connected by a semicolon. Um, in APA, there are two kinds of dashes. So there is the M dash and the N dash. And the M dash is kind of a longer dash that indicates that you are adding something that amplifies or digresses from the main clause. Um, I tend to be a, a bit of a squirrel chaser in conversation. Um, and so, and my husband always says, he's like, uh, he's like, okay, that was a tangent, let's come back. <laughs> And so he says, if you if you had a favorite punctuation mark, it would definitely be the M dash, because that's exactly what it's intended for, is to indicate that you've digressed from the main clause, and then you're coming back um, to the clause after having added that information. Um, an N dash is longer and thinner than a hyphen, but shorter than an M dash. Um, and this uh, N dash is used between words of equal weight and a compound adjective. So first generation student, for example, would use an N dash um, and to indicate a numerical range. So the N dash, if you are thinking about page ranges, either for a direct quote or um, in your reference list, that punctuation mark is not a hyphen, it's actually an N dash. Um, and then just as a quick note, there should not be a space before or after the N or M dash. Okay, in terms of quotation marks, uh, this is also a very common uh, error we see. Um, commas and periods should be placed inside quotation marks unless there is uh, unless the quotation marks are followed by parenthetical material. 
Other punctuation marks like colons, semicolons, and ellipses should be placed outside quotation marks. We'll look at an example of this in a little bit. Quotation marks should also be used uh, to refer to a letter, word, a phrase, or sentence as a linguistic example or as itself. So for example, the singular they. Um, single quotation marks are really not used in APA for emphasis. So if you're going to use, um, if you're if you're wanting to emphasize a term in APA, uh, italics would be appropriate if you're emphasizing a word that you are about to define. Uh, quotation marks are appropriate for the purposes expressed here. Um, we also use double quotation marks to reproduce material from a test item or verbatim instructions to participants. Um, and then probably the one of the most common outside of enclosing a direct quote in double quotation marks is to introduce a word or phrase that is used as an ironic comment, as slang, or as an invented or coined expression. Um, and then if you use italics or quotation marks to add emphasis within your work, you want to not use that same emphasis for subsequent occurrences of that term throughout the text. So um, you would, for example, enclose a term in uh, double quotation marks one time or italicize it one time and then don't use that again throughout the manuscript. Um, in terms of hyphenation, compound words are words that are composed of two or more words, um, and these take a, a lot of different forms. So um, healthcare system is an example, that, uh, compound with two separate words, one hyphenated word like decision-making skills, one solid word like like-minded. Um, a couple notes on hyphenation for you just to help you with self-editing your own work. Um, if the compound appears after the noun it modifies, the hyphen should not be included. So one of the things we see often is students writing about decision making, right? So decision making skills, in this case, decision making would be hyphenated. But when you say skills such as decision making, in that case, there is no hyphen. Compound words that contain an LY word are not hyphenated. So highly qualified candidate, for example, would not be hyphenated. Compound words that contain a comparative adjective are not hyphenated. So for example, better prepared student would not be hyphenated. Um, and then I would strongly recommend adding a sticky note to page 164 in your APA manual because there are 36 prefixes that do not take hyphens. Um, some of these would include words like um, anti-bias, bi-weekly, co-curricular, non-traditional, post-secondary, socioeconomic, and so on. So there's a lot of words that we think would take hyphens that don't actually take hyphens in APA. Um, some notes on capitalization. So uh, we should capitalize the first word in a complete sentence and the first word after a colon if what follows the colon is a complete sentence. We also capitalize proper nouns, proper adjectives, and names of specific departments at universities, academic institutions, and academic courses. So the real guidance around capitalization is to just think about whether it's specific or general. Um, APA is considered a down style, which means most things are lowercase unless there is uh, guidance to capitalize them. So most of the time, the default is going to be lowercase. Um, in terms of job titles or positions, we should capitalize a job title or position when the title precedes a name, but we would keep it lowercase when the title follows a name or when we are referring to a title or position in general. Um, and then when we are using trade or brand names within a paper, they should be capitalized, but we should not include copyright or trademark symbols. Um, and then this is a big one. So um, there's a lot of things that we might think would be capitalized that in APA style are not. This includes diseases or disorders. Therapies, treatments, theories, concepts, hypotheses, frameworks should be in there, principles, models, and so on. Um, within any of the above, if there is a person's name, that of course should be capitalized. So if you were referring to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, for example, the M in Maslow would be uppercase. Um, we also do not capitalize names that begin with a lowercase letter. So if you had a last name like Van Henry, where the name is spelled with a lowercase v, uh, APA's guidance would be to retain that lowercase v in all instances of that name throughout the paper, including at the beginning of a reference list entry, at the beginning of a sentence, in a parenthetical or narrative citation. Um, so really just honoring the the authentic spelling of the person's name. Um, the same is true for a brand name or a proper noun that might begin with a lowercase letter. You would retain that lowercase letter at the beginning of a sentence. Um, and then a lowercase statistical term at the beginning of a sentence should also uh, be kept lowercase. It looks a little funny, but it is uh, actually the rule. Okay. Um, let's talk about numbers and then I'll pause for uh, some questions. Um, 
This can be a little bit tricky because uh, most people know sort of the general guidance around numbers, which is that uh, numbers under 10 should be spelled out and numbers 10 and above should be written as numerals. Um, however, there are probably 25 exceptions to this, and so it can create uh, quite a bit of confusion. Um, so numbers 10 and above throughout the paper should be expressed as numerals. This refers to both cardinal and ordinal numbers. Numbers that immediately precede a unit of measurement should be written as a numeral, regardless of whether the number is above or below 10. This is also true of numbers that represent statistical or mathematical functions, fractional or decimal quantities, percentages and ratios, and so on. Um, it, this also applies to uh, numbers that represent time, dates, times, ages, scores and points on a scale, exact sums of money and numerals as numerals. And finally, when you have a noun paired with a number to form a label, the noun should be capitalized and the number should be written as a numeral. So let's say you had the three phases of a study, you would refer to them in your paper as phase one, phase two, phase three, and so on. Maybe you had um, multiple weeks of a study or you are giving your participant pseudonyms, for example, then they would be participant four with a capital P and that number would be expressed as a numeral. Okay, let's pause real quick to see if there are any questions so far. We have a couple. I had a question about um, ordinal numbers. Mm -hmm. so, so should you ever write something like, you know, June 10th um, or even in doing anything that's ordinal, what, 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 what do you what do you do with ordinal, ordinal numbers? If you're if you're writing a date, you would actually just do like June 10 comma in the year. So you wouldn't actually include the, the TH at the end of it. Um, the uh, oftentimes where we see ordinal numbers are like uh, if you're referring to someone's like first year on the job, it's common to write FIRST, but it actually should be one ST. Um, because it's uh, an, an ordinal number, it's an ordinal number attached to a unit of measurement. So there's there's some there's some tricky guidance around this, um, but I, I would definitely look at the examples in the manual. I think that will help to give you some um, some clarification. Um, but when you are thinking about like um, the twelfth grade, for example, versus the sixth grade, the twelfth grade would be one two th, and sixth grade would be spelled out. That's probably the easiest example to use. Uh, regarding the M dash, uh, one is using an M dash as sort of a tangential comment considered academic tone, and two, does it sort of replace the parenthetical comment um, that we would think of in general writing? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I um, I like the use of the M dash, and I think as long as it's not overused, I think there are times where uh, it makes sense to indicate that you're sort of adding uh, sort of this tangential thought to the sentence. And because it, it, is, uh, it is sometimes a way to, to sort of break up your writing a little bit, create some, some flow and some variation in your writing. Um, and I usually, um, you know, sometimes I'll see students use parenthetical material and I will sometimes recommend that they shift it to an M dash or put commas around it. It just sort of depends on, on how it's used. Um, so I don't, I don't, I, I would still consider it academic. I don't necessarily think that it's a, a negative thing. I mean, I think if, if APA was firmly against it, they probably wouldn't have included an <laughs> entire section on, on that particular punctuation mark. Yes, on canonical writing, um, do you always advice on using it or not using it? If, for example, if you're using like Genesis or you're quoting a scripture, what would what would you recommend? Can you can you ask the beginning of that question again? I'm sorry. I think it's referred to as canonical um, when mm -hmm. you're trying to cite scripture. For example, um, when when should you use it in terms of like the Book of Genesis and you're quoting a verse? Um, could you expand on that? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And you know, given um, given the time that we have left, I want to make sure that we get to um, citations. But why don't we why don't we follow up offline? Because there's a pretty robust section in APA on um, on citing uh, 
you know, biblical verses, et cetera. So um, uh, John will have my email address and can connect us. And then I can, I'm happy to respond to some questions that way. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, so there are um, there is some more in this section on the mechanics of style. So um, there's information on italics, abbreviations, statistical and mathematical copy, the presentation of equations and lists. So some other things for you to follow up on. Um, I want to look real quickly at some things on tables and figures, and then we'll talk about um, citations in the time that we have left. Um, so tables and figures have traditionally been placed. Um, after a full paragraph and after the table or figure is first called out and a call out in APA is when we say we um, say see table one, for example, and that call out really should be placed after text where you want to alert the reader that there is supplemental um, supplemental information that they should look look to uh, to get more information about about your content. Um, the, a table or figure should not repeat your content, right? There's there, they should be um, supplementary. They should complement your content, but should not be a direct repeat. So you wouldn't want to have, for example, a paragraph full of percentages followed by a chart or a table with all of those same percentages. Um, so you wanna do either one or the other, whichever you feel is, is the, uh, the best for your particular presentation of data. Um, the standard is really mostly across the country is mostly this, uh, which is to include tables and figures in the text after a full paragraph um, and after the table or figure is first called out. There is another option um, in the last 18 months since, since APA 7 was released, we've only seen this uh, from one campus and that's to place tables and figures on separate pages after the reference list with each table on a separate page and then each figure on a separate page. Um, just as a quick editing tip, um, you should not use the words above or below to refer to the location of a table or figure within the text. It suffices to just say in table one or in figure two, um, or to the location of content in general. So you want to avoid saying in the sections below or in the sections above. Um, you should say you know previously or next, um, but trying to avoid those uh, directional cues. Um, and then the table and figure components are now parallel in APA 7. Um, so the label and number are positioned above the table or figure in bolded text, and the table or figure title is one double space below in non bolded title case italicized text. Um, the notes are um, included below the table or figure in the same format. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Um, so this is a sample table. Um, so you can see here how the table is uh, labeled here in bold. Here's the uh, title. Uh, the note is included below this. Uh, my screen got a little scrunched here, but this note should be double spaced. But the word note here is italicized and there's a period here, not a colon. Um, and then the figure looks exactly the same in terms of the formatting of the label and the title and then the note being double spaced below. Um, so this really has created more visual consistency in the presentation of tables and figures within, uh, within the document. Okay, we're going to go ahead and talk um, about uh, works credited in the text. Um, some of you may be more or less familiar with this, but this is the standard uh, format for, uh, for sources with one, two, and three or more authors in APA style. And you can see here that there is a corresponding parenthetical and narrative citation. Um, so uh, if you have a source with one author, the parenthetical citation would include the, the first author's last name, comma, the year, the narrative citation would look just like this. If you have a source with two authors, the only difference here is that um, in the parenthetical citation, you want to make sure to use an ampersand, and then in the narrative citation, you would want to just use the word and. Um, and then in the seventh edition, when you have a source with three or more authors, you immediately shorten to the first author's last name followed by et al, period, comma, and then the year. And et al is uh, short for et alia, and it's Latin for and others. Uh, it's also a very common answer in the New York Times crossword puzzle. If you are, if any of you are as obsessed as I am, probably shows up at least three or four times a week. Um, but this is the correct format here. And you just want to make sure to include the period and the comma here. Um, the punctuation around this does uh, matter, and it is often um, uh, there are often errors in that punctuation. Um, there's a sample here for the first uh, citation for a group author with an abbreviation. 
So you can see here, if you were citing the American Psychological Association, for example, and you wanted to introduce the abbreviation, um, to use that abbreviation for subsequent citations throughout the text, um, you would enclose that in brackets. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but we don't use nested parentheses in APA, so you wouldn't have parentheses inside of parentheses. Um, if you were introducing the American Psychological Association for the first time as part of the narrative, you would uh, include the full name of the organization, introduce APA immediately following, and then the year for the source. And then in either case, for all subsequent citations, you would uh, be able to just use APA 2021 uh, throughout the rest of the text. Um, and then if you had a group author without an abbreviation, very easy, you just spell out the full name and include the year. And again, that author and year should always be separated by a comma within the parenthetical citation. Um, and then when you are organizing your citations within the paper, you want to make sure that they are alphabetized by the first author's last name. Um, we spend a, a significant amount of time alphabetizing. Um, so when we think about, you know, the, the editing process and the amount of work that it takes, um, some of the types of things that we often work on are very easy things that, um, that students can take care of on their own before submitting their final dissertation. So it can be everything from, um, you know, alphabetizing the citations to the punctuation within those citations and so on. Um, I do want to talk about appropriate levels of citation because this is something that can create quite a bit of confusion. Um, both paraphrases and direct quotations require citations, of course, um, but according to APA, uh, under citation can uh, lead to plagiarism, of course, and self-plagiarism. Um, over citation is, uh, is often unnecessary. Um, you probably have seen chapters where there is a citation after every single sentence, and that can be really, really distracting for the reader. Um, so it's, it's important that we kind of learn how to strike the balance between these. Um, it's considered over citation to repeat the same citation in every sentence when the source and the topic have not changed. Um, so when we're paraphrasing a key point in more than one sentence in a paragraph, we should cite the source in the first sentence and we do not need to repeat the citation. And the trick is as long as the source remains clear, um, so we always want to make sure that we're being as clear as possible for our reader that we that the information that we are presenting is in fact from a source that we've cited. Um, so as an example, let's say you've come across an article that I've written and it's you write Henry 2021 wrote blah blah blah. And then in the second sentence you say in their study blah blah blah. Well, in that case, you don't actually need to include another parenthetical or narrative citation because you've used the words in their study and so you've made it very clear to the reader that you are still referring to my work. Then let's say in the third sentence, you, uh, you paraphrase something from my source, but you don't include any sort of indication that you've done so, and you also don't include a citation. Um, then we have the possibility for misattribution or plagiarism. And so that's really what we want to avoid. Uh, we wanna make sure at all times that it's as clear as possible um, to the reader that we are in fact uh, paraphrasing from a particular source. Um, as a quick note, um, all sentences with a direct quote should include the author year and a page or paragraph number for the location of the quote within the source. So just remember, anytime you have a direct quote, all of that information should be there, the author, the year, and a page or paragraph number, even if that source has been cited already within the paragraph. Um, so let's look at a couple of quick examples. Um, here are sort of three examples of how a direct quote might be set up uh, in your work. Now, I'm sure uh, Dr. Beard has probably uh, shared this with you or talked to you about this, but generally speaking, um, direct quotes should be sort of limited within academic writing as much as possible um, because uh, we, what we often see are papers with, with so many direct quotes that it's not clear that the, that the writer has actually really integrated uh, the, the scholarship on the topic into their own thinking in a way that they can articulate it on their own. So as much as possible, you do want to, to paraphrase and not quote directly, but it is important to just sort of from a formatting standpoint to see how these um, should be formatted and structured within the paper. Paper. Um, so I mentioned earlier about periods and commas falling outside of the parenthetical material after a double quotation uh, mark. So you can see here that when you have a direct quote set up, uh, this is the page or paragraph number goes right here after the quote, there is a space between the P period and the page number and then that period would follow. Um, the other thing around uh, direct 
quoting um, is that you are really paraphrasing as well is that you always want to make sure that the author's name and the year are as close together as possible so you don't want to start a sentence with Henry blah 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 and then have the year sitting at the end of the sentence by itself in parentheses you always want to keep them as close together as you can um, if a direct quote is included mid sentence um, parenthetical materials should follow directly after the quote not at the end of the sentence so um, oftentimes we see this p 33 right here this page number over here at the end of the sentence instead of right after the quote. So that's an easy thing to remember. Um, and then page or paragraph numbers are not required when you are uh, paraphrasing an author. And of course, this can be confusing because it can indicate to the reader that you have included a direct quote, but not enclosed it in double quotation marks, um, which you want to avoid. Um, I know we are um, at time, um, so I'm going to um, scroll through this real quick and then just show you a couple of examples um, that you can follow up on. Of course, these are in the APA manual. Um, uh, so you can, of course, look them up there, but I wanted to at least show you that within the presentation, there are uh, examples of what a typical academic journal article entry would look like within the reference list. So this is what an, an academic journal uh, article entry would look like for a one author article with a DOI assigned to it. This is what it would look like for that same article, but with two authors. Uh, just as a quick note here, there is a comma before this ampersand, which is often missed. Um, and then here's an example of an article with three authors that for the author element is the same. Um, just remember that comma there before the ampersand. Um, and then uh, the DOIs in, in APA style can either be formatted in the blue underlying text or they can be converted to black non underlying text, but they should be hyperlinked um, all the way through your paper to help facilitate access for your readers. Um, there's also uh, some examples here for you that you can look at later um, on what a journal, an academic journal entry would look like for um, an article that has a stable or permanent URL assigned to it, uh, which would look something like this. Um, this is the uh, an example of what a book would look like. So this is the, the reference entry for a book. Uh, this is the reference entry for a, a chapter in an edited book. The chapter author should be given credit right here. And then this is the title of the chapter, the editor name, the name of the book, um, the page numbers, and then the public, uh, the location, uh, excuse me, the publisher information without location information. Um, and then finally here is just another example of what this would look like if there were two editors. So you would uh, separate these editors names with an ampersand. Um, the ED would change to EDS period here. Um, and then lastly, just a couple of reminders. Um, in the seventh edition, all authors up to 20 should be included in a reference entry. This has shifted from the sixth edition. It used to be seven, it is now 20. So if you have a source with up to 20 authors, you wanna make sure that all of those names are included. There is guidance in the manual for what it would look like to eliminate authors' names if you had a, a source with more than 20 authors. Um, reference entries should be alphab alphabetized by the first author's last name or the name of the group or organization as author. Um, you always want to make sure that the sources cited in the dissertation have a corresponding entry in the reference list. We just returned a dissertation. We've got like a two week window to finalize a dissertation for a student from one of our campus partners, and they had 75 missing references from their reference list. Um, which I cannot even explain how much that complicates the editing process when we find that many references missing. So definitely important to um, make sure that you have corresponding lists between that reference list and everything cited in your paper and vice versa. Um, and then if a source has an assigned DOI or stable permanent retrieval URL, one should be included. Um, just as a quick note, if you are working within the Johnson University library environment and you click on the link in your browser and add that to your paper, it's going to take the reader to a password protected library login site, which is not appropriate for the reference list. You want to make sure that your reader can actually access your sources. So you'll want to make sure that your DOIs and URLs are formatted in such a way that they are able to, that the reader is able to access those um, off of the Johnson University Library website. Um, and then I think we're there, but I want to, I know we're at time. I wanted to see if there are any quick questions. Um, and then I will, I'm sure that the next presenter is ready to get going. Yes, yeah, Sarah, my question was, 
you said that uh, in multiple authors that uh, you should alphabetize the author. It, is, it, uh, that confused me. I thought who, whatever it's listed on the, the article that is how you list it on your reference. That's, that's correct. I'm sorry. In the, um, here, we can go back and look at it. So you would alphabetize by the first author's last name. So you would always keep the authors in the order of authorship. But then within the actual narration using the citation, that's where you alphabetize them? If you're using a parenthetical citation like this, where you have multiple um, different sources cited, you would alphabetize the source with Goldfian as the first author before Henderson and Henderson before King. But you don't change the alphabet, alpha, you don't change the order of the author's names. Does that make, does that help? Yep. Okay. Uh, more questions? Yeah, thank you so much. And God bless you for what you do. This is oh. a <laughs> so I appreciate it. Um, do you have any recommendations or comments on some of the um, electronic tools for doing reference lists? Mm -hmm. Are they reliable? Can we depend on those in terms of, you know, we have access to RefWorks. Some have mentioned Zotero. What are yeah. your thoughts on those? Absolutely. Yes, I do have thoughts on those. Um, so I think that the, the software out there is incredibly beneficial for organizing purposes. Um, I will tell you that if you enter things in incorrectly, it will come out in your paper incorrectly, meaning that you have to enter it in right, especially for like Zotero and Mendeley. Um, it, it doesn't have the, the precision of a human being, believe it or not. So um, uh, they can get you pretty far, um, but I've never, I've been doing this for uh, five years uh, and I have never, seen a completed reference list with a perfectly edited um, list of references from a, a, one of those software programs. So it, you know, again, it'll get, it'll get you uh, further in the sense that it'll help you to organize your sources. It's very helpful in making sure that everything is, that's in the paper is also in the reference list and vice versa. Um, but in terms of having like a perfectly edited reference list in uh, compliant with APA 7, um, you're still going to probably have to do some tweaking on your own or or rely on, um, you know, on, a, on an editor to kind of clean up some of those nuances. And that's really, you know, there, the APA manual has over 100 examples of different types of references, and that doesn't include legal references and a lot of other different types of references. So um, all of those software programs are fairly robust, but still somewhat limited in terms of how much they can actually produce, uh, given the level of precision required of APA. Thank you. Okay, last chance. <laughs> no questions. Oh, got one. Uh, when citing in references uh, titles that choose to be, I don't know, creative and how they title their own texts, how far do you follow their formatting versus APA's formatting? So I see like M dashes and titles. I see, you know, something colon, something, something, colon, something, something, you know, all that kind of stuff. Do you kind of clean it up on their behalf or do you leave it with the parentheses as they've put it? And even if it's not, you know, accurate, so to speak. Yeah, I would, um, I would, yeah, definitely keep it as close to what the author in, intended. Any other questions? And just to let you all know, this has been recorded and at the conclusion of the summit, we'll be sending you all the recordings and materials and stuff we have. So if you didn't get a picture of every slide or take every note, uh, she's gonna send her presentation to us. We're going to include that with this video, which will include this back and forth question and answer. So you will have resources in order to be able to follow up on this. Perfect. Yeah, and you and you all can uh, contact me anytime too if you have questions. You know, we do have a formal partnership with uh, with Johnson University. So if you ever are working on a paper and you just are like, hey, am I doing this right? You know, feel free to, to nudge me. Um, we're happy to help you. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is just um, know that this is, a, you know, this is a language sort of 
unto itself, right? There, there is a lot to learn. Um, there's 427 pages. I've been at this for 28 years and I still learn new, new things every, every day. So um, just take little bits at a time uh, and know that eventually it'll start to click, uh, especially with, with practice. So thanks for letting me be a part of your day. I'm so sorry that I wasn't able to be there with you in person, um, but I hope you have a great summit and hopefully I'll get to meet many of you in person next year. Thank you so much, Sarah. Would you show your appreciation for Sarah? Thank you, Sarah.